Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here, and we are starting a new series today called It's Complicated, and it's about relationships. Has anyone noticed that relationships are very complicated? Anybody that says relationships aren't complicated is either a bully <laughs> or a pushover, there you go. right? Because I've met people that are like, relationships are easy. My wife just does whatever I say. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure it's real easy for you until you're divorced. Or the woman that's like, yeah, it's easy. I just do whatever he says. But then if someday one morning she wakes up and she's like, I'm tired of doing whatever he says. And if you've got kids, you know that's complicated. As soon as you think you got them figured out, they change on you. It's just complicated. Relationships, got work relationships, very complicated. Sometimes you get in over your head and relationships at work, and you're like, oh my gosh, what, do I have to quit this job? Because I can't survive this anymore. We're going to talk about how complicated relationships are today. And we're going to start with a word this morning that I absolutely hate. I'm telling you, if you bring up this word, I will leave the room. So I started researching words. You ever have a word in your life where you just like, whenever anybody says that word, you go, ah, don't say that word. Yeah. Anybody, right? I looked up the most five hated words in the English language. Do you know what one of them is? Moist. moist. <laughs> Somebody said it right out the gate, moist. People are like, ah, moist. You know another one people hate? Gurgle. <laughs> anybody like that word? Yeah. Here's another one, squirt. Somebody's, it is a good soda. It's grapefruit, right? Yeah. There's these, there's these words that make people cringe. And then there's the worst word of all. Y'all ready for it? Intimacy. I can't even say it. See how quiet it got in here? All you men are like, oh, God, I think I'm getting a phone call. This is the worst word on the planet. If you bring this word up, I'm like, don't say that. Especially the worst part is when they're like, it's really great when men get intimate with each other. I'm like, shut up. I don't, don't say those two words together. Men and intimate? No. I hate that word. Anybody relate? Thank you. I'm not alone. Some of you women are like, what is that guy's problem? Intimacy is the greatest thing in the whole world. Here's intimacy, right? Intimacy is simply close familiarity or friendship. It's closeness. So in counseling, I have a master's degree in counseling. They teach us this thing where they say, if there's a word that you need to deal with, but you don't like the word, go to a thesaurus and find a word that's similar enough to it that you can tolerate that word. So you're like, well, I've got an anger problem, but I don't like the word anger because I don't want to think I have anger. Well, can you, can you call it frustration? Yeah, I can go with frustration. So this morning, my, my topic is this. I hate intimacy, but I like closeness. So we're going to call it this morning, rather than using the word intimacy, I'm going to call it closeness. Okay? Is that cool? And you ladies, can you, you can hear intimacy in your head, and guys can hear whatever. If closeness is just a little too much too, go with whatever you want, right? But I think we all, deep inside, we want to have a closeness to someone. We do. In fact, Here's something. If, let me ask you a question. If somebody were to come up to you and say this, hey, somebody told me something about you and I want to know if it's true, would that make you nervous? Yeah. Would you assume it's going to be bad or it's going to be good? Yeah. Who would assume it's going to be bad? Yeah, who would assume it's going to be good? Of course my wife would. <laughs> the perpetual optimist. But you know, we've all got parts of us that we want people to see. And then we've got parts of us we don't want people to see. We've got that thing where like, I don't want anybody to know that, right? Think about it for a second. What's the thing you don't want anybody to know? Manny, we'll start with you. Tell us. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. We've all got parts of us where God, ah, that is a thing I do not want people to know about me. And so it never comes up. And if you see it starting to go that direction, you change the course of the conversation. 
Maybe it's something from your past and you go, we don't, want to, we don't talk about that, right? And there's certain things in your relationship that are like bombs. You just, they're like mines, you know, uh, landmines. And you go, we don't talk about that thing when we're talking. And, and there's certain things we just don't want people to know. Stuff, stuff from your past that you just don't want to tell your spouse because you're like, man, if she knew about that, woo, it would change everything. And you know, that's the hard part about dating is you're, everybody's kind of dancing around that. Have you ever thought about that? I've often said if Emily were to ever die on me or something, I would never get remarried because I don't want to have to mess with that whole process of figuring out, like, who is this person over here? And whenever we meet somebody, we always want to put the best foot forward. We want to be known for something, right? I was just at this conference this last week, and it was so fascinating watching people introduce themselves. Uh, it's a bunch of over, overachiever, type A driver types, and um, everybody's putting their best foot forward you know, and talking about all of their accomplishments and stuff. But what's crazy, if you, if you listen long enough and you just sit there and just listen, and I've got this weird thing, I don't know if it's, maybe it's, I asked the wrong questions or something, but people just really, like, will openly unload about their life with me. Emily said it's because I ask follow-up questions and I shouldn't. But <laughs> I'll be in a grocery store line. I'll be like, hey, how's it going, man? Happy, Merry Christmas. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, not Mary Mary? No, next week I'm going to see my sister. And last time I saw my sister, man, we got into this huge fight. And then like there's beer bottles flying and everybody's yelling. And then Trump came up. And then I just, and I'm like, whoa, man, I'm just trying to buy some bread. Like, <laughs> this happens to me all the time. But it's wild. If you listen to somebody, of, like for a little while, usually they'll start to tell you the dirt, even if you don't want to know. Because there's this thing in us that wants to be known. And sometimes we're willing to even tell the negative side if we feel like we're in a safe place. Mm. We're like, okay, I'll, yeah. it, it, it's just the nature of us. And I think like intimacy, if you really kind of try and want to figure out what that word means, I, I think it simply means this. We all want somebody to see inside of us, to see who, really, who we really are. Into me, see. I want you to see into me. But a lot of times we've been hurt, and so we go, I don't want you to see that part, but I want you to see this part. The challenge is, when we're truly getting close to somebody, you're going to see the good and the bad. And we need to be in a place where we can be really vulnerable and naked and show all of that. And you know where that comes from? Well, if you read Genesis, it comes right from the beginning. If you read the story, it says Adam, God made Adam, he put him in the garden. But it says, for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused man to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Shame is simply, you know, guilt is saying I did something wrong. Shame is feeling there's something wrong with me. And deep inside of us, we've all got a sense there's something wrong with us, and it comes from this. And there's tons of stuff we could unpack from this passage, okay? Like, I mean, one of them, and I'll make this really clear since we live in the twilight zone, uh, there's two genders. Amen. We laugh, but the world has gotten so confused we forget, like, people are actually teaching. There's, you know, millions. there's two genders. There's man and there's woman. And here's the really thing. The ideal situation God set up is for man to be married to woman. It's all right here. It's the system that he put in place. And when that system is in order, we're meant to know each other and see each other for the fullness of who we are in intimacy. And we're also meant to be totally open and vulnerable with God. And the marriage... Reunion, or union is, is part of that picture of that. God has these feminine elements to him and he has these masculine elements to him. And we see God always referred to as a man in the Bible. But the reality is God is neither. He's God. <laughs> and he has all these elements of him. He has these gentle, you know, what are generally considered female traits, but he also has male traits. He's the perfect, perfect. That's why we're created in his image. Man and woman together, come together, can show the different sides of who God is. And again, every man is different. Every woman is different. There's these stereotypical things. We say, well, women are this way. And it's not always the case. But there's these general things that we're, it, it, there's, 
He made it this way for a reason. A man and a woman, and a man is being made to be married to a woman. And when you get out of that order, chaos ensues. And things get really complicated. But you know what complicates it most? Sin. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, it says, and they realized they were naked. And they started doing whatever they could to cover themselves. And they sewed fig leaves together. Eventually, God actually created clothes for them. But this is a picture of what we all feel. We all feel deep inside that we've got something we need to hide. But yet there's this deep desire within us for people to see us and to know us and to accept us in all of our vulnerability and nakedness. And it's this tension we feel. Because some of you, man, your whole life, that's been abused. And anytime you've opened up a little bit, somebody's used it to take advantage of you or to abuse you. And so now you're like, "Uh uh-uh, ain't nobody going to mess with me. And you've got this wall around you with good reason. You have your reasons, and I get it. But yet, there's also these moments where you're crying in your bed at night going, does anybody really know me? And then some of you, man, you've been open and vulnerable, and, and, and really, you need to rein it in a little bit. <laughs> Honestly, you're scaring people. <laughs> but you're just like, I need to be known. Anybody relate to that tension? It's complicated, isn't it? So the answer is love. I know the Beatles said that. All we need is love. But here's what's tricky about that. All we need truly is love. It's God's love. But you know what's challenging about love? It's complicated. Anybody that tells you love isn't complicated again, is either a bully or is a pushover. So Paul, he talks about what love is in the most famous love chapter in the whole Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. He says this. He says, guys, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but don't have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Have you ever met somebody that is the most eloquent communicator in the world, but you can tell that the only person they're in love with is themselves? Paul's saying, you got nothing. Even if you are like a master of the English language and you can write prose and you can communicate. And this is why this is a crazy thing. You see some of the greatest poets and artists, they lived very solitary, separated lives. Paul said, that means nothing. I don't care how good of a communicator you are, how smooth you are in front of people. Narcissists are really great communicators. I don't care how smooth you are. If you don't love people, you got nothing. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains but don't have love, I'm nothing. This is why Christians are some of the worst. They just know what God had to say. And they're going to boldly declare the truth to you and drop the mic and walk away. They also don't recognize that when you're speaking truth, you must use minimum necessary force. Because you may win the battle and blow away your adversary, but the people that have been blown away don't usually like to hang out with the people that blew them away. You lost. You may win every marital battle over your wife, but you're destroying yourself because you really don't have love. You're a bully. If I give all possessions of the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. This is a real problem in our world today because do you know what what virtue signaling is? Virtue signaling is saying the right things that you know are going to get you affirmation because you look compassionate. Paul's like, if you say the right things that make you look compassionate, but you don't actually love those people, you don't get any credit for it. This whole woke thing we live with right now, it's a lot of virtue signaling. It's a lot of bullies. I'm a loving person, and I do not love you because you don't love like I do. You're out of the club. No soup for you. This is what it is. It's when you have this look like you're loving, but you're really not loving, and you're like, I'm so compassionate. Look, I put hashtag save the poor people. I've got the little heart around the thing, I'm vaccinated, or I'll never get vaccinated. I'm really loving. I'm speaking the truth. It's our problem in our world today. This is real stuff. The Bible is real stuff, y'all. 
So he says this. And this is where love gets really complicated. He says, love is patient. What's patience? It's the ability to walk at somebody else's pace even if you want to go faster. Some of y'all think you're loving. You're just a bully. But here's the other challenge with this. Sometimes you have to push people a little bit beyond what they think they're capable of. And you look very impatient with them. But until you push them, you with your kids. If I were infinitely patient with my daughter, we would never get anywhere. And don't even get me started on my wife. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'm kidding. Hashtag I'm offended, right? Yeah. Love is kind. What's kindness? Kindness is being gentle. But have you noticed that sometimes gentleness doesn't mean you just coddle people? It means you call greatness out of them when they can't see it in themselves. And the kindest thing you can do is say, the way you're doing that, that's not going to get you where you want to go. And that can be the kindest thing you can do. But it's complicated. Just complete, total acceptance, which is what the world tells you, is just accept everything everybody says about themselves. That is not love. It doesn't envy. I am just convinced that most of humanity is driven way more by, by jealousy than we want to acknowledge. Yeah. People, you know, they say they hate the rich, but really it's just because they wish they could be. It doesn't boast. I am so compassionate. <laughs> if you were as compassionate as me, you would understand. But you're not enlightened like me. Not love. Run from anybody that tells you how compassionate they are. It is not proud. That speaks for itself. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. How much love is actually self-seeking if it comes down to it? How many people need to be needed so bad that they'll actually sabotage other people's success so that those people will run to them to save, so they can save them? Yeah. That's not love. It's complicated. You know what's really tricky is? Our motives can be really, like, confused. You can be starting, you can be serving somebody at the start for really compassionate purposes and for non-self-seeking reasons, but then you start to get some affirmation from it, and then your whole identity gets wrapped up in saving people, and all of a sudden your motive is shifted, and you didn't even realize it, and you're not loving anymore. You're actually closer to hating someone because you're not strengthening them to go on their own, and there's certain personality types this is a real danger for. Love's complicated, isn't it? Keeps no record of wrong. Oh, whoa, 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 here's one. It's not easily angered. That's my problem. I get angry and I say, I just love these people so much if they would just do what I said. <laughs> All their problems would be solved. <laughs> it keeps no record of wrongs. How many of you, well, I'm not going to ask you if you live with them, but how many of you know a scorekeeper? Everything's going along fine, and then they bring up something that happened 10 years ago. Well, you always do that. Remember on the honeymoon? Like, where did that come from? They've been sitting back there keeping a record of wrongs. Not loving. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And we'll, we won't even go into comp how complicated all those are. But let me tell you this, I think the most dangerous thing in the world right now is misguided love. Evil we can spot, but love can look so sneaky sometimes that what we think is love and we really are convinced it's love, it's actually doing more harm than good. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the, child, the ways of childhood behind me. Now, I'm going to be really honest with, some, with something, okay? 
I don't know what this means. Paul, sometimes when you read him, you're like, what in the flip are you talking about, dude? He had insights beyond, I mean, just literally God himself taught Paul. When Paul became a Christian, it says he like was swept, he was taken to the desert where God himself instructed Paul, okay? So he had insights that I don't understand. And when I come up with something that I don't understand about Paul, I assume I'm the problem, not Paul. Because Paul got in the Bible and I didn't. So here's what he says. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I'm known in part, then I shall be fully know, or I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain: faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now I have been racking my brain, not just all week, but for months, trying to figure out what is Paul talking about in all this. When I became a man. I was, I was a child, and, I was, and I, then I grew up, and then I started stopped it, acting like a child. I don't know exactly what he's saying here. But here's what I think he's moving towards is this simple statement. There's a connection between growth and your willingness to be vulnerable. Because if you see here, he says, when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, he's like, he talks about when he grew up and then he put away these childish things. And then as he grew, it says, eventually we're going to get to a place where we know fully as we are known. We're like, it's, we're back to the garden of Eden where we can be vulnerable and not have to be afraid. And what I think he's saying, and listen, this is infinite layers. I'll be trying to figure out this till I stand before the Lord and ask him to explain it to me. And and I just want to encourage you with something. Guys, if you're reading in your Bible and you don't understand something, welcome to the club. But it doesn't mean it's not something you need to learn because one of these days it's going to become clear to you. And I'm believing one day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to go, oh, that's what that meant. I don't know exactly what he's talking about, but I do think this. There's a connection between growth and willingness to be vulnerable. The goal is to get back to that place where we're open, not only before God, but also before others. But it's complicated. Because the way I've got it figured, this is something I was thinking through. I don't have any science to back this up, but this is the way I've got this figured. I think there's about five levels of closeness, okay? And this is really important. I'm going to get really into the weeds here, so this could change the way you relate to people. First level of closeness is superficial. This is small talk. This is what happens in the grocery store. Man, this heat is brutal. How about this weather? Hey, I think it's going to rain. How are you? And what's always the answer? Fine. Fine. They're superficial levels of closeness, and and we hang out there most of the time. That's kind of what's expected societally, especially down here in the South. You just kind of Southern hospitality. How you doing, sweetie? Good. How y'all? It's your superficial closeness, but that's not real closeness. Somebody could be dying of cancer over here, and they're like, how you doing? I'm fine, because that's what you're expected to say. There's informational closeness. This is where you start to tell like stuff you like. I like movies, where I went on vacation. Oh, I just got back from a cruise. Oh, that's cool. And we, we share this when we, people we know a little bit better, maybe at work. Like, yeah. But from then on, there comes a risk. Three, four, and five levels, three, four, and five, the way I've got it figured, it's risky. The first one is perspective. The level three I would call perspective, which is where you risk sharing your perspective on things like the stuff we're not supposed to talk about at work, religion, politics. There's a reason people say don't talk about that stuff at work. It's a deeper level of intimacy, and it's risky because you may go, I voted for Trump, and then your coworker never talked to you again. Or I voted for Biden, and people are like, what's wrong with you? (laughs) So it's risky to share that stuff. And then it goes a little bit deeper, soul level, where you start risking your feelings, sharing your feelings and your hopes and your dreams and your emotions. Yeah, this is where guys are like, I'm out. And there's this soul level where we start, you know, our soul is made up of our, our, our thoughts, our, our, our desires and our emotions. And, and this is where it gets tricky because I really think that 
All these levels are important, and there's some places where these levels are called for, and there's some places they're not, because the final level is what I would call truth closeness, and this is where you risk share. this is total vulnerability, where you risk sharing secrets about yourselves, your fears, your failures, and it's all because you're confident you're in a safe place, and we all need to get to this place. Tragically, I know a lot of marriages that never get there, because you got hurt, and now you're like, I ain't playing this game anymore, and so you stick right up here or maybe right here. You get it done. You're staying together for the kids, but there's none of this. And some guys are like, well, where's sex on here? (laughs) Sex is a result of getting past this. The good stuff is at least. But you know what? There's a lot of people that have sex trying to do it up here, and that's why they feel so dirty afterwards. Because they don't actually know you. They just used your body. That's why you feel so dirty looking at porn. It's superficial. It's not true closeness, which is what God calls us to, where there's this vulnerability and give and take, and like, here's the good and the bad of me, but you're going to accept me as I am. And in your relationships, specifically in your marriages, this is the goal. We want to get here. And, And here's what's really dangerous. If you're not getting this at home, you might have somebody at work that's willing to go there with you. And you get to maybe this soul level with them, and you start talking about the challenges of, yeah, it's really hard with my wife, and... Ever since the baby came, she's just not really into this that much and that. And, and the girl's like, oh, that's so hard. You're such a good guy. And, and man, that must be really, I feel so bad for you. And let me, you know, wait, maybe we should go out to, and talk about it over drinks because I don't want you to have to feel this way. And, and all of a sudden, you're stepping into a, a domain here that should be reserved for the most intimate, uh, I hate that word, relationships. But we get there because we need it. And you're not getting it at home, so you're going to try and get it somewhere. And this is where we get in trouble. And this is where it's so complicated. Because there's some relationships that need to stay up here. And then there's some relationships that really need to be here. And I believe the goal in marriage, this is where God talks about marriage between a man and a woman, comes right here. You say, well, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not married. Well, hey, that's, that's all right. You can still find somebody that you can risk the closeness with, but it's always a risk because as soon as you open up yourself and show a little bit of the parts of you, you'd rather those things you don't want people to know, somebody could use it against you. But for you to truly find the fulfillment that you're you're desiring, that tension you're feeling within you, you're going to have to risk vulnerability. And it's really scary. And that is why marriage, a committed marriage is so important. Because you know what the, we know what the value of marriage is? It's basically saying this. I'm going to connect my life to you so much that I'm not going anywhere. Living together doesn't cut it. Living together, man. Look, the world will tell you, well, you got to try it out first. There is no level of commitment in living together. Yeah, you may have your finances tied together. But ultimately what you're saying is, I just need an out. That's really what you're saying. And I may sound so old school saying that. But I'm telling you, Marriage has been the foundation of humanity for millennia for a reason. And anytime you move an ancient boundary stone, King Solomon talked about this, he's like, don't go moving an ancient boundary stone set up by your fathers. We may think we're so enlightened, but you know it if you're in one of those relationships right now where you're living some, with somebody. Because here's the thing, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel judged. I'm just telling you, marriage is the key. It's the foundation because it's saying... I'm so committed to you. I'm going to tie my life to yours in such a way that if we ever separate, it's going to destroy both of us. And if you've been through a divorce, you know that's what happens. But that feeling of I'm never going, he's, Emily, she's not going anywhere. I know she's not. We've committed to ourselves. We never bring up the D word. It's never, it's not even something to joke about. So I tell her, she's going to have to die her way out of this marriage. (laughs) And I'm not going anywhere with her. And when you've got that confidence, you can go, all right, here it is. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's the power of marriage. It's, it's, it's the goal is to get to here. But I also think it's an image of what God wants to do with you. He wants to set, make you realize, I accept you. Like, I already know the stuff you're trying to hide from me. I already know it. I made you. I've been watching the whole time. But I love you anyway. And I'm not going anywhere. 
And that's the beauty of marriage. That's the beauty of committed relationship. It's all a picture of God's love for us, but it's been so screwed up in our world that it's complicated. All we really do need is love, but love is tricky and it requires lots of insight, which is what we're going to talk about next week. So here's what I just want to close with. First of all, how willing are you to go here? Second of all, have you been going here with somebody you are not supposed to be going here with? Third of all, maybe you need to let God in a little bit closer because he already knows you're, what's going on. And your willingness to experience his unconditional love may just open the door for you to recognize, yeah, humans are going to get it wrong. They're going to hurt me sometimes. But still, it's the closest picture to what, the goal is to make it the closest picture to what God's love is as we walk it out with other humans. And the beautiful thing about this is when you feel known, you can conquer the gates of hell. When you feel loved unconditionally, you can charge the gates of hell with a water pistol. It gives you courage. It gives you confidence. Go, yeah, I know know I'm not all I should be, but man, there's somebody who loves me in spite of that. And that's God. And the goal, too, is in relationships with others to have that confidence. When a kid feels that, kid grows up strong and confident. But you know, you can't project that to your kids if you don't feel it yourself. What we don't deal with, we transmit to our kids. And maybe it's time that you start getting a little more open and vulnerable. And that's the goal of this series is we're going to talk about how relationships are complicated, but they don't have to be. The key is tapping into what God says about what love is and how to walk that out in our relationships. You guys receive that? All right. That was really good. I didn't think it was going to be that good, honestly. Lord, please humble me. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Lord, I thank you so much that you love us unconditionally. Man, there's nothing. You've seen it all. You've been watching the whole time. (laughs) There's nothing we can do that shocks you. There's nothing we do that throws you off. And I thank you, Lord, that that's your goal in our relationships. So I pray that over the next few weeks, you'd begin to just show us where we need to Maybe we've been too open with somebody that doesn't deserve that or should not be having that because the relationship, the commitment's not there. And Lord, I pray for those that are, man, they've been feeling alone and isolated by themselves. I pray, Lord, that you would just help them open up that door and we just, our relationships would reflect you. So we thank you for that. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Christ. That's the first step in this journey of closeness. He already knows you. He knows what you've done. Nothing has caught him off guard. And he wants to forgive you of everything you've done if you'll come to him and repent of your sins. So we're going to say a prayer in just a second. And if you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is going to come and transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness. He's going to forgive everything you've ever done. And he's going to put you in the kingdom of light and set you up an eternal address with him. It starts when we say this prayer. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Uh, We've got some resources for you at the information booth in the back. You guys can stand. Hey, real quick, I I mentioned I sent out a Monday encouraging email every Monday. Tomorrow is one that's really good, by the way. Uh, If you haven't signed up for that email list, I'm not going to spam you with anything. But if you want to sign up for that, just scan this QR code, put your email in there, and you'll get an email from me every Monday. You guys are dismissed. Be blessed. Bring a friend next week. I'll be up next week talking about more of the complexity of relationships. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>